<coughs> Excuse me. I'm trying to get your attention. <coughs> Pay attention. Masking up. I'm dreaming of a COVID Christmas. This is part three of four. Since 2020 has been such a crazy and unique year, I decided to use some of these new or popularized phrases from this year and apply them to this Advent season. So on the first Sunday of Advent, we talked about social distancing. We saw that the original social distancing was not a solution to a pandemic problem, but rather was the ultimate problem of sin separating us from God and Jesus taking on flesh in Bethlehem, Emmanuel, God with us, was the solution to that problem. Before the first advent, we went from being hopelessly separated from God to having God in the flesh dwell among us, being our Emmanuel, God with us. The social distancing problem solved. On the second Sunday of Advent, last Sunday, we talked about lockdowns. The ultimate lockdown in the history of the world was being enslaved to sin and death because of the fall of Adam into sin. Jesus came on that first Advent to set the captives free. That was the uh, reading it today as well. We were so enslaved to sin and our sin nature that we were totally depraved, totally innate, unable to do good apart from Christ. Jesus came in the flesh to save us from the ultimate and eternal lockdown of all lockdowns. Today we're going to we're going to the now common practice of masking up and, and what it has to do with Advent season. Uh, 2020 has introduced some serious disagreements as to whether wearing a mask is helpful or essential or just pointless or whatever. There's a lot of debate. Uh, you probably remember when this whole thing started, uh, wearing a mask was discouraged at first. Even the Honorable Dr. Fauci said, don't wear a mask. Uh, the opinions of the experts continue to change and are all over the map. My point today is not to prove that masking up works or doesn't work to prevent transmission of viruses. Uh, my personal opinion is that mask requirements are being used more for catechizing us into compliance than in preventing any virus, if you wanted to hear my personal opinion. We all have different opinions regarding this, but none of us should uh, condemn others for having the opposite opinion. Uh, the pro-masking up crowd believe that wearing a mask is, is a way to love your neighbor. Obviously, nobody here loves their neighbor. <laughs> Although most of the pro-mask people drive their cars regardless of the fact that driving in a car could end up in an accident and someone end up killed. Uh, factoring in the fact of deaths caused by car accidents, I think you could say, you could make a case for the fact that driving a car is to completely fail at loving your neighbor. You're putting your neighbor at risk. The anti-mask crowd believe that wearing a mask is clearly bearing false witness against your neighbor by perpetuating a lie that masks actually work in the spreading of this virus. Masking up for many is not really about a cure or prevention for COVID, but is instead a way to virtue signal and even shame those who with non-compliant naked faces <clears throat> without masks. Some people just see them as face diapers. I don't know, whatever you want to <laughs> But that's not what I'm talking about today, so we'll just get past that. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of it. I want to talk about another use for wearing masks and then show what it has to do with Advent season. <clears throat> Need some more water. Guess I should have been wearing a mask. <clears throat> <laughs> um, historically, there have been many uses for masks. Do you have a little picture of a mask in the back of your book? <laughs> I forgot to look at what, how that turned out. That's, a, that's the oldest known stone mask, thousands of years old. Um, what was I saying? There's been many uses throughout history for masks. 
It's funny that that oldest mask looks like the happy face that we now have <laughs> on our, the big yellow happy face. Nothing new under the sun, right, honey? That's at least my wife's favorite verse. So there's the, the one which has been popularized today in 2020 is for protection. That's one of the uses for masks, for protection. There's the oxygen mask, a burn mask, surgical mask, face shield, CPR mask. In the 1300s, there was a beaked mask, like a big beak from a bird, uh, beak containing herbs in the beak worn by the plague doctors to try to ward off the, the black death. So that was one of them. There's the respirator, the filter mask, the oxygen mask, and the diving mask. Masks are also used in sports. There's football helmets, which include a mask, uh, baseball, ski mask, hockey mask, and paintball masks. There's also the wrestling lucha libre masks <laughs> that are sometimes worn along with stretchy pants, <laughs> just for fun. I was going to bring one and demonstrate, but I decided not to. <laughs> no masks, not stretchy pants. <laughs> to big guys like me, all pants are stretchy pants. <laughs> Um, another use for masks is uh, for entertainment or performance. Masks were often used in ancient theatrical performances. Stage actors would wear a mask pretending to be something they were not. <clears throat> masks were worn in comedies and tragedies and today are still used in horror films. Speaking of the ski mask. On a... Uh, oh, that's a hockey mask. Yeah, hockey mask. <laughs> no, ski the ski masks are kind of, Lisa hates those ski masks. They scare her. She won't let me ever wear one. I'm just going to talk about Lisa today. <laughs> um, okay. In fact, an actor's mask is the definition of the word hypocrite in the New Testament. I think I've told you that before. Uh, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery explains what the word hypocrite means in the Bible. Here's what it says. The word hypocrite is based on the Greek theatrical words that mean actor or to play a part. The essential identity of hypocrites, therefore, is that they pretend to be something they are not. Psalm 26.4 calls them false men and dissemblers. But in the Gospels, the implications are more specific. Hypocrites pretend to be paragons of religious piety while lacking spiritual virtue in their inner souls. They honor God with their lips but their heart is far from them, Mark 7, 6. Now, the same dictionary goes on to show how this word was applied to the Pharisees specifically. The Pharisees are the hypocritical or the prototypical hypocrites of the Bible. A composite portrait is easy to assemble from Jesus' denunciations of them. They are ostentatious when they give alms with the intent that people will praise them, Matthew 6, 2. They pray in the synagogues and street corners, so people will take note, Matthew 6, 5. When they fast, they disfigure their faces. They tithe their garden produce, but neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. In Jesus' caricature of them, they clean the outside of a drinking cup, but ignore the filth inside it. They are self-righteous. They teach people false religious beliefs, and they prevent people from entering the kingdom of heaven. They try to trap Jesus by pretending to be perplexed about issues. We are not surprised that they have a special place in hell, Matthew 24, 51. Jesus' climactic exposure of hypocrites is to picture them as whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness, Matthew 23, 27. I mentioned Matthew 6, and that, that's the dictionary, uh, the biblical imagery dictionary. Matthew 6, 1 through 4 says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. So practice, practicing your righteousness before other people is another way of saying performing your righteousness. You're giving a performance. You're pretending. You're acting. Pretending to be righteous. Practicing your righteousness 
is just like performing your righteousness or pretending your righteousness or play acting your righteousness or putting on a righteousness mask and faking your righteousness. And Jesus is warning against that. Verse 2 of Matthew 6. Thus, when you give to the needy, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, as the mask-wearing actors do in the synagogues and in the streets, they, that they may be praised by others. Again, their main motivation for pretending to be righteous, for play-acting, for wearing a mask of righteousness was in order to be praised by others. Their, their motivation for giving was to be praised. Jesus says, truly, I say, to, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This might be a good thing to be reminded of at Advent season. Giving is not enough. Giving is not enough. Gifts are not enough. Again, God looks at the heart. If you are giving something, or if you're giving someone a gift for Christmas, what is your motivation for buying it? What is your motivation for giving it? Is it like the Pharisees in order to be seen? Would you be horrified if the receiver of your gift never knew it was from you? Would you be horrified at the fact that they don't know who, was, who it was, came from? Do you give at Christmas in order to be praised by others? Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. We see a, a theology of gifts in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 as well. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's a favorite verse for those who want to receive a gift. Come on, you want to give to me, don't you? God loves a, re a cheerful giver. He goes on, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He who sows, he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. Why? For sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. God gives to us that we may give to others. He supplies so that you may give. You will be, he, he continues, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So the reason he gives to us is so that we can give to others and so that thanksgiving to God may follow. This is why I think it's appropriate that Thanksgiving and Christmas are so close together on the American calendar. It's the, the, the point of his giving to us is so that we can give to others and to give thanks to him because it all comes from him. Verse 12, for the ministry of this <clears throat> service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So the beauty of gift giving is that it meets a need, which is, which is one good thing, but it also that it results in thanksgiving to God, which is another good thing. Verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. That's 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. So the ground and basis of all generosity is the generosity of God toward us, especially in the gift of his son, the ultimate, most costly of all gifts. All our gifts or whatever kind uh, of whatever kind are to be grounded in that, in the grace of 
uh, of Christ on the cross. All generosity finds its root and origin in the ultimate gift of the first advent when God so loved, loved the world that he gave his only son. When we give anything at Christmas or any other time, we ought to be reflecting and reacting to God's grace to us in Christ. It shouldn't be about being seen by the one receiving the gift. It shouldn't be about being praised by others. Jesus says when you give a gift, don't sound the trumpet in order to, for everyone to see <clears throat> that you are the giver of the gift. That's pharisaical hypocrisy. It's a form of wearing mask. It's a form of wearing a mask, pretending, play acting, to be this generous giver when all you really want is to get the attention for giving. Gift giving can be good or bad depending, depending on the intention of the gift giver. Remember what Paul says in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And then verse 3, he says, if I give, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Notice what Paul said there. He said that you can give away all you have and gain nothing in doing so. Why? Because if it doesn't come from love, it, it means nothing. It, it's more self, selfish love than selfless love. If it comes from pharisaical pride and pretending to be seen and praised by others, it means nothing and you gain nothing. The one you gave to gained something, but you gain nothing. Because it was for the wrong reasons. You're just wearing a mask a mask of generosity instead of giving because you're gratefully generous for the generosity and grace shown to you in the person and finished work of Christ. Are you giving because you're grateful or are you giving because you want the attention, you want the praise? You're being selfish. It's kind of weird to think that giving can be a selfish thing. It can be a selfish thing. The fact that we have been given the ultimate gift in the incarnation of Emmanuel, God with us, we base our giving on what God has given to us. We give because he first gave to us. Everything we have is because it was given to us by the great gift giver. James 1, 17 says, every good gift. Can I lay down there too? <laughs> that looks so comfortable. James 1 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In Matthew 10, 8, in the King James Version, Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. The ESV says, you received without paying, give without pay. You've received without paying, give without pay. Freely you've received, freely give. All our gifts should be a means of celebrating the great gift that was given to us in Christ. Doug Wilson puts it this way. We celebrate the incarnation, the pre prerequisite gift that enabled God to give us the even greater gift of the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus was born to die. And all of this, birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, was given for us men and for our salvation. Provided we remember why we are doing it, it is entirely fitting that we give Christmas gifts to one another. It would be weird and strange if we did not do so. That's Wilson. But again, giving for the wrong reasons is just wearing a, a gift-giving mask. We all wear a mask at different points in different ways, at different levels, different kinds of masks, different kinds and colors of masks. We don't want to be seen as we really are. So we all wear masks. Sometimes we care more about our performance or our act than we do about our behavior and our actual actions and motivations behind our actions. We're not as concerned about our sincerity as we are about our believability before others. Even though God looks at the heart, our main focus is often on outward appearance, on outward appearance. And everybody said, 
<laughs> Must be just me. You say, obviously you don't care about outward appearance. <laughs> we can become experts at pretending, and I think we all are in, in a way. Everyone we think is buying it. They really believe it. We convince ourselves that we're getting away with it. We might even convince ourselves that we are actually being who we're pretending to be. But God looks at the heart and is not for a moment tricked or fooled by any mask we choose to wear. The omnipresent, omniscient God is not fooled by our mask any more than, any more than he's fooled by fig leaves we try to use to cover our nakedness and shame. So with all that being said, another historical use for masks, other than protection and performance or entertainment, is as a disguise. Masks are used as a disguise. Masks are sometimes used to avoid recognition, not to be recognized. As a disguise, the mask acts as a form of protection for the wearer who wishes to assume a role or task without being identified by others. Often thieves and other criminals wear a mask in order not to get caught, not to be recognized, to get away with things. Disguises can also be used by secret agents. They're, they're in disguise. They're, they don't want to be recognized. So what does this have to do with Advent and Christmas? I believe the first Advent was the ultimate disguise. Jesus came into the world, and his life, at first, seemed like a sad and tragic ending to a sad and tragic story. The long-awaited Messiah had finally come. That's what Advent means, coming. He finally came. And it seemed like his life in the flesh ended in tragedy. But as we know, things weren't as they seemed. When he came, chaos, conspiracy, and conquest were just masks disguising what was really happening, disguising what God had planned all along. One thing we need to remember in this Advent season, 2020, is that things can seem to be going all wrong when God is right on schedule and working all things out for the good. God is sovereign. Everything's going exactly as he planned it before time began. A virus or a presidential election cannot dethrone God. It's all part of his story that he wrote a long time ago. Yes, it was joy to the world. The Lord is come. But he ended up dying an excruciating death on a cross. It seemed like his mission was an utter failure as he hung from that cursed tree. The one who came to set the captives free was eventually captured himself and crucified on a cross. Chaos, conspiracy, conquest seemed to be the victor. Satan and demons celebrated their victory. The Christmas story, it seemed at the time of the cross, to be a tragedy, a tragic ending, a sad ending. I brought this up uh, uh, earlier this year at Easter time, but I think we need to be reminded of this again. This is Herbert Schlossberg in his book, Idols for Destruction. He has a great quote in there about this disguise, this idea of disguises. He says this, we are, not, we are not the lords of history and do not control its outcome, but we have assurance that there is a lord of history and he controls its outcome. We need a theological interpretation of disaster, one that recognizes that, recognizes that God acts in such events as captivities, defeats, and crucifixions the Bible can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs disguised as disasters. I love that quote. We could add to his list and restate it this way. We need a theological interpretation of disaster, one that recognizes that God acts in such events as pandemics and economic crashes. The Bible can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs disguised as disasters. 
all of history, not just the Bible, but all of history can be, ter can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs disguised as disasters. Or to put it another way, uh, well, that's, that's the way I'm going to put it. <laughs> it. It's a disguise. It's, well, let's put it this way. All of history can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs wearing a disaster mask. A series of God's triumphs wearing the mask of disaster. Chaos, <coughs> conspiracies are just masks that disguise the fact that God is still in control. Control and everything is happening exactly as he planned all along. And this is what we see at the first advent. Advent ended in crucifixion. But that's not where, that wasn't the end of the story. The crucifixion was just triumph in disguise. It was the greatest triumph of all time disguised as the greatest disaster of all time. This is how and why Jesus would enter Jerusalem at the beginning of Passion Week in triumphal procession, even though he was going to end up being crucified. The crucifixion was not the end of the Christmas story. The crucifixion wasn't the ending. It was only a disguise that our conquering king of kings was wearing. He seemed to be overcome by death when he was actually conquering it. He didn't just die. He also rose from the dead, ascended up into heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. One of my favorite things to listen to is an Easter sermon uh, given by S.M. Lockridge, who was a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, uh, from 1953 to 1993, and I'm just going to read the read part of his sermon. This, you can listen to this on YouTube. He does it a lot better than than I'm gonna. But here's a, a sermon you probably heard. I think I may have read this before. It, it's 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 Friday, <laughs> and Sundays are coming. You probably heard that. Here here it goes. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's a sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is den denying. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning, and evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know it's only Friday and Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday, it's only Friday, Sunday is a coming. Again, that's S.M. Lockridge. Good Friday, you could say, was a mask of Resurrection Sunday in disguise. Psalm chapter 2, uh, one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament, along with Psalm 110, says this, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, his Messiah, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and ter terrify them in his fury, saying, 
As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. God's enemies conspired together against Yahweh and his Messiah. They thought they had won when he hung from that cross. But he wasn't conceding. He was conquering. The cross was a mask that was disguising what he was really doing. On Passion Week, he entered Jerusalem as a king riding on the donkey. The crowds shouted, Hosanna to the king. It was politically, it was a politically and ecclesiastically subversive act. Jesus came into the world not just to save the world, but to confront the world, to subvert the entire system. He came to turn a world upside down, right side up. The triumphal entry was triumphal, even though he was going to the cross. It was the resurrection on the other side of the cross that made his entrance triumphal. But our God loves to disguise triumphs as disasters. He loves to put disaster maps, masks, maybe also maps, disaster masks on triumphs. But we know what was really happening. In the crucifixion itself, Jesus was pulverizing principalities and powers in the crucifixion itself, he forgave the sins of the lost and the broken. It was in the crucifixion itself that he conquered and triumphed over all evil. It was in the crucifixion itself that Jesus crushed that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. Of course, that again reminds us back to the beginning of the story, Genesis 3.15, which is the first mention of the gospel when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The bruised heel of Jesus was just a mask. It was just a mask disguising the fact that he was not only bruising, but crushing the head of the dragon, the head of the serpent. Jesus accomplished the victory by dying instead of killing by dying instead of killing. He crushed the serpent by letting the serpent bruise his heel. Isaiah 53, that great passage prophesying about Jesus, says in verse 3, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus crushed by being crushed. He knew that down was the way up. Dying was the way to life. The crucified became the conqueror. The cross was a mask disguising the victory that he was gaining on the cross. The first advent was filled with chaos and conspiracies and embedded in the Christmas story and in the birth of Jesus into this world is a dark story of loss and tragedy and tears and pain. Matthew 2.16 has been called traditionally the massacre of the innocents. Listen to Matthew 2.16-18. Then Herod, 
when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. It was a sad story. Christmas story had a darkness to it. Uh, the, Chris, the first Christmas was covered or masked in darkness, but the true light had come. John 1 makes this clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Should I have you guys sing this? Because they sang this in their uh, Christmas play. <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, John was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. At the end of the first advent, when Jesus hung from the cross, it looked like evil was triumphant, but the reality was evil was being disgraced and, disgra and degraded and destroyed. It looked like darkness prevailed, but dawn was about to burst out of the tomb. Colossians 2, 13 and 15 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Tragedy? Disguised, or, or tr a triumph disguised as tragedy. Only in Christ can triumph come as a result of losing. Only in Christ can triumph come as a result of being defeated. He won the battle by dying in it, and three days later by rising from it. The crown of thorns was a mask disguising the crown of glory. All authority has now been given to him, and he reigns at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us and making a footstool out of his enemies. So even in the craziness and the chaos that seems to be happening this Advent season, 2020, we need to remember that chaos and craziness are just masks disguising our Lord's triumphs. The Lord reigns. Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. <clears throat> hold on, hold on to that thought. Until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we, are we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. 
for who hopes for what he sees. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And here's the verse, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So remember this when your life seems overwhelming. Remember this when things seem out of control. Things may be out of control, our own control, but they're never out of his control. He's sovereign, he reigns, and his loving kindness endures forever. When we see everyone masking up this COVID Christmas, let us remember and be grateful that God disguises his triumphs in the masks of tragedies. Advent has a happy, em has a happy ending with an empty tomb and a reigning king who invites us to his table. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Our Father, you have given us the gift of salvation, and we possess nothing that we have not received from you. Like little children at the dollar store buying a present for their father with money given them by their father, we are simply returning to you something that you have bestowed upon us in the first place. And yet we do it gladly, knowing that you receive it gladly. We pray with gratitude and, de and delight, and we do it all in the kind name of Jesus.